This is the Portuguese Republic, or just Portugal as most people call it. Known for its love of the sea, popular football players, delicious food and um, some other stuff. One thing you might not expect to come from here is video games, but we do have some. And today I thought it would be cool to take a look at a few different games developed on Portuguese soil, some of which you definitely have heard about. And let's start with Marco Carrasco's work, specifically his ZX Spectrum games he made along with his colleague Rui Tito. I'll link all that I could find below, but I decided to choose only some of their most interesting games. Starting with Autotank from 1985, which um, I'll give you some time to figure out what it means in English. There seems to be both an English and a Portuguese version of the game, so I decided to go with the former so you guys can understand what's going on. Just for the record, I'm using an emulator called ZX Spin, which I'll link in the description, running on 48k mode. I tried some other emulators that were instead emulating the 128k, which brought some glitches to the game, like the tank randomly blowing up and all of the mines being replaced by the word spectrum, which multiplies whenever you collect a letter, resulting in a crazy mess. But with that aside, the game can be pretty entertaining, despite how simple it is. I could describe the game myself, but I thought it would be more interesting if we took a look at how Portuguese computer magazine Mini Micros described it in 1985, in an issue where the game even made it to the cover. In this game, you fight against two enemy tanks who are controlled by the CPU. Your objective is to prove the superiority of the human race, having to neutralize the mines put by the CPU in the battlefield. When your tank neutralizes 12 mines, the CPU will prepare a harder level for you. Your tank moves at twice the speed of the enemy tanks, but the CPU finds itself in a numerical advantage. Good luck! And in classic old-school computer fashion, you had to manually write the entire program in order for you to play it. It doesn't get any more open source than this. Now we have Baz Lunar, also from 1985. Once again, the name isn't rocket science or anything, pun intended. In this game, you control a spaceship that has to defend a lunar base from asteroids. This game was featured in the next issue of the Mini Micros magazine, so let's take a look at what they had to say about it. Keep the meteorites from wearing out the lunar surface and from hitting the batteries that provide energy to your spaceship. When a battery is hit, the energy will be interrupted and you will lose a life. For every meteorite you catch before it gets to the surface, you will gain 25 gallons of energy. No idea why they used gallons, but okay. You will be able to restore the lunar surface by pressing M. For each repair, you will lose 50 gallons of your energy. So yeah, basically you sacrifice your spaceship in order to save the moon. Cool little game, though sometimes it can be a bit difficult to catch the asteroids. Next, we have the well from 1986, the first multiplayer game on the list. In Duel, you and your opponent control these spaceships that shoot lasers, and if your laser hits the opponent, you gain 5 points. There is not much more besides that. There's a timer, and when it finishes counting, it says who won. That's it. Next time you put a parsec to play something with your friends, maybe give this game a go. After that we have Monstrous, also from 86. In this game you find yourself in a sort of dungeon, and your job is to avoid slash shoot the monsters and collect those gem looking things. At least that's what I think it is since I couldn't play much due to how difficult it is. So while you entertain yourselves by looking at me being terrible at this game, let's take a look at what the developers had to say about it. You went on an adventure that didn't go too well and here's the result. You find yourself in a castle, having received an evil spell from a witch who forces you to get to her diamonds, scattered across the castle. The witch has three pet monsters who aren't too fond of you, who will do anything they can to make you work harder. But it's not that bad. The witch, being aware of her monster's attitude, has offered you a mystic weapon. That doesn't end the monsters, but somewhat relieves the situation, transporting them to another part of the castle. Work as well as you can, and maybe the witch will grant you freedom. Good luck. What a great description. This is from the book the developers made, which is just a collection of some of their games, with simple descriptions like this one to set them apart. Now on to the final game from this collection, that being Alien Evolution from 1987. The first thing that caught my eye was how many control options there were compared to the other games. Anyway, when I started the game some sort of tunes started playing. Either the developers were into electronic music or my emulator was glitching out. You play as a sort of vehicle and your job is to keep the aliens away from this… garden? base? I don't know. After some time trying to figure out how the controls worked, 
I found out that you can use the right control key to switch between weapons and backspace to use those weapons. The days before WASD and computer mice were weird to say the least. As for the weapons, they range from landmines to bullets that look like the ones from Mega Man, though this game actually predates it by a few months, to Bomberman styled bombs and some other stuff I couldn't quite figure out. Due to how my Gen Z brain can hardly comprehend and play games that are even slightly harder than Animal Crossing, I couldn't get very far in the game. I eventually got a game over after a bit and called it a day. To compensate for this, however, I took a deeper look at the game's history and found quite a few things about it, mainly that it was published by Gremlin Interactive, which, after being dissolved by parent company Infogrames, which became modern Atari, they were formed as Sumo Digital, a fairly recognizable name, as they work on a variety of Sega games and made the new Sackboy game. As for Karashku, he is now a professor at the University of Algarve, and has been for a few decades now, so good for him. With that out of the way, let's move on to some other stuff, specifically Elifood, originally released for the ZX Spectrum in 1987. Elifood was one of the first games in the manager genre. It came into fruition when its creator, pilot and programmer Andrei Elias, was frustrated that 1982's Football Manager, although entertaining, was a single-player experience only. Elias wanted to play these sorts of games with and against his friends, so he decided to make a similar game in BASIC for the ZX Spectrum, and thus, Elifort was born. More versions were made during the next few years, until Andre stopped to focus on his studies. However, while looking for mentions of the game online, he was surprised to find the game was still alive, as it had become a bit popular in Brazil. Motivated by this newfound popularity, Andre Elias returned to the game dev world with Elifort 98, releasing new versions every two years or so ever since, with the latest version being Elifoot 23, which you can get on Windows, Android, and iOS. Despite being way more popular in Brazil, it always comes to mind when you think of the few Portuguese games out there, as it's incredibly hard for most Portuguese people to not think about football for a second, regardless of the topic. Now let's skip over a decade to talk about Gambies, released for the MS-DOS in 1997. Gambies is a puzzle video game developed by Viage Interactive. It has a focus on the environment and recycling just around the time the Portuguese started caring about it, as this was released not long after the foundation of Sociedad Ponte Verde, an organization known for spreading awareness about recycling in Portugal. Anyway, the game itself begins with a cutscene, featuring some pretty cheap 3D graphics, though most 3D looked cheap in the 90s anyway, and this cutscene tells a tale about these little creatures, called Gambies. And, well, it's not exactly a tale, it's more of a bible about these things, complete with their story, their names, their abilities, with all of this information being bombarded at me, this game must be amazing, right? Yeah, not really. When I heard that it was a puzzle game, I thought it was going to be something interesting like Fez, Portal or even Tetris. But by puzzle, they meant a virtual jigsaw puzzle with creatures that sometimes work and can sometimes help you put the pieces together. Suffice to say, I didn't really understand how the game works. Thankfully, there is a demo that, just like the intro, just goes on and on and on. To be fair, there is some charm to it, even if the gameplay isn't very good, it's a pretty good story and it has pretty good character design. I even managed to find some blog posts by the artists and developers who posted some never before seen 2D art of the Gambies, which makes them look way better than they do in cheap 3D or low quality bitmaps. As it turns out, the game was supposed to come out earlier, around 1995 or so, as development began in 1993, and something like this wouldn't be too bad during those years, but the game instead released in 97, well into the Mario 64 era which was quote, detrimental to the project, making it seem outdated in this era of rapidly advancing technology. However, the reception was positive in the peninsula, so I guess that's a good little ending, even if it didn't fulfill the expectations of the international market like the team had hoped. Going into the new millennium, we have Portugal 1111, or Portugal 1111, Full name being Portugal 1111, a conquista de Sor, released for Windows in 2004. Portugal 1111 is a real-time strategy game, compared at the time to Civilization 3 and Age of Empires 2. It was developed by Cyberbeat and published by the Visão magazine, one of the most popular in the country to this day. The game puts you in control of the reconquest of Sor. Now one of the many municipalities belonging to the district of Coimbra, Sor was once occupied by the Moors, 
a term used to describe the Muslim people who inhabited the Iberian Peninsula before the Christian reconquest. Based on this, the game puts you in the year 1111 AD, the year the Christians won the conflict and first proclaimed Sur as a part of the county of Portugal, as Portugal wouldn't become an actual country for another 30 years. So how is the game? Well, it seems to have had a pretty good reception at the time of its release, receiving positive reviews and even selling out in most of the country. I myself remember this as the Portuguese game and always wanted to try it, and well, this video made me finally do it. I started a campaign and upon entering the game I was immediately shocked by the fact this game had voice acting, and it's not awful like other old or low budget games, they sound, well, like normal people saying normal things, though I later realized they say right or right away every time you tell them to go somewhere. Certo. 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 I was playing with this a bit more than whoosh, the camera just flew right away and again and again and again. And this instantly reminded me of something one of my favorite creators, whose username I just blatantly stole and switched his name for mine, complained about and fixed in LEGO Island. The issue being that the camera systems for these games were made with all computers in mind. So when a newer, much more powerful PC runs the game, a lot of old games have their camera system rendered nearly impossible to use, which is the case here. So with the whole game being nearly impossible to play, not that I know how to play these games anyway, I checked some stuff before I quit. Firstly, I checked the other team, so to say, you could play as, those being the Morse. Surprisingly enough, these also have voice acting. I don't really know what they're saying and if this is actual Arabic, but considering the game was made with help from historians at the University of Coimbra, I'm guessing it's not complete gibberish. One thing that received a lot of praise in the game was its rule editor. Think of Minecraft's game rules, but way more complex, and there's one for every single thing in the game. This essentially lets you fully customize the experience to your own taste, which makes it a great feature to say the least. If you want to run the game, a virtual machine might solve the camera issue depending on how you configure it, or if you have a PC from the early to mid 2000s nearby that is almost guaranteed to run the game as it was intended, with no issues whatsoever. Jumping over to the 2010s, we're going to take a look at Miniclip. Yes, that Miniclip we all grew up with. Miniclip is, in case you don't know, a Swiss company, but their first and main mobile division is Portuguese. They had the idea to expand to Portugal in 2010, when they asked developer Sergio Varanda, who had previously worked on Skype, to gather a team and start investigating the potential of mobile gaming, which was much, much more archaic at the time. Soon after, Miniclip Portugal was established with a small team of 5 to 12 people, with their offices taking place in the Tegas Park, a technological park located in the Greater Lisbon area, which contains the Tecnico, Portugal's largest engineering school, as well as many institutes and companies that are related to the realm of technology. It's the closest thing we have to our own Silicon Valley. Within a month, Minically Portugal already had a finished project, that being a mobile port of the 2009 puzzle game Fragger. Soon after, they started producing their own games, such as 8 Ball Pool and Gravity Guy, 8 Ball Pool being the most popular game made by this team and the most popular miniclip game overall, with over 1 billion downloads and still counting. According to Wikipedia, these three games were the only ones made by Miniclip Portugal, but they're busy enough with 8 Ball Pool alone. In 2015, 20 out of their entire team of 90 people were only working on 8 Ball Pool, by introducing new features and providing technical support. While the end of Miniclip's iconic online games might have been upsetting for a lot of us, their now complete focus on mobile gaming is a good thing for the Portuguese division, with it being the one they talk the most about, though they have also expanded to countries such as the Netherlands and Italy. Now moving on to the world of consoles, we're gonna take a look at Under Siege, released for the PlayStation 3 in 2011. Under Siege is a real-time tactics game developed by Seed Studios. The game offers both a single player and a multiplayer experience, and some other interesting stuff like a level editor. I wanted to get the game to work on my PS3, but I couldn't find any copies of the game either physically or through some other methods, so I'm gonna have to use gameplay from the channel 10 Min Gameplay instead. The game takes place in a medieval fantasy world, and it focuses on the protagonists Eirik, Carrie, and Asgir. The game offers multiple control options, including the PlayStation Move, there even is a comic book about the game named Under Siege First Encounter. 
The game received average reviews, mostly due to how difficult the game can sometimes be. Eurogamer's 7 out of 10 review perfectly describes the general opinion towards the game, by saying that it, quote, requires a degree of patience and tolerance before it truly clicks. If you have the required resolve, there's plenty to admire. On a national level, the game won the grand prize at the 2010 Zon Multimedia Awards. God, this is old. Pretty sad that I couldn't give it a try, but as someone who has a hard time with difficult games, maybe it's for the best. Next up, there's Munin, released on multiple platforms on the 10th of June 2014. Day of Portugal. How fitting. Munin is a puzzle platform game, oh no, developed by the indie company Gojira, and is themed around Norse mythology. The game tells the story of Munin, whose wings were taken away by the Norse god Loki. This makes her embark on a quest to retrieve them with nothing but her legs, with the player helping her by rotating sections of the level in order for her to progress. The game has around 70 levels, so there's quite some time to be spent. 7 hours to be precise, at least according to Wikipedia. Sadly, the game didn't receive a lot of attention, as it was released on the same day E3 2014 began. Polygon took a look at the game a few weeks later, saying that it was, quote, rough around the edges, but it has an inspired core, and giving it a final score of 7.5, which is higher than what they gave to a lot of AAA games. And last, but certainly not least, we have Quest of Dungeons, also released on multiple platforms in 2014. And before I start, huge thanks to my good homie Razek for buying me this game on Steam because I was completely broke on every payment app imaginable. Link to his channel will be in the description. With that aside, as soon as you enter the game, you notice that it's quite polished compared to most of the other games we've seen. I mean, it's also the most recent one on the list, so it has that going for it. This is a game in the roguelike genre, like Enter the Gungeon and The Binding of Isaac. It's a genre I always found pretty cool, but never had the chance to play. Until today. After starting a new game, you can choose one of four characters. The warrior, the wizard, the assassin, and the shaman. You are then shown a cutscene that, well, I don't really know how to explain it. Just watch it. After it's over, you spawn in this sort of tutorial room. It doesn't really teach you anything, but it's so basic it's hard to call it anything but a tutorial. There's even a sign with a skull that makes you lose immediately. You can of course leave that room and explore the rest of the dungeon, but before you do that, you are instantly attacked and have to defend yourself and retaliate. When that's over, you loot the enemy. Pretty basic stuff. And that's basically what I did during my first playthrough. Just went through doors, fought against enemies, Found out there's a health bar and food system, which would be good to know sooner. Found a boss, lost, and found a little shop where I bought more food. I didn't really do much more because I'm not particularly good at the game, and I realized this was more than enough for a quick overview. And that's it. Wikipedia's list of games made in Portugal has way more games than the ones I just showed you, but a lot are mediocre shovelware or a port of a game made by a foreign developer. And from my point of view, these, well, most of them, were the hidden gems from that list. With all of that said and done, I hope you liked watching this video. Make sure to like and subscribe to stick around and to share the video if you feel like it. I have a pretty good video coming for the holidays, so make sure to stay tuned for that. Anyway, I hope you all have a nice day.